I'm tired of explaining myself. I'm tired of the sudden swell of adrenaline when I sit down beside a new person on a plane or talk to a new friend, and they ask that dreaded question, now what is it that you do? I have 10 answers to this question. I'm an innovator. I'm a city builder. I'm a designer. I'm an urbanist. I'm a change maker. Having multiple ways of describing what I do is at once empowering and exhausting. Because we don't live in a world anymore where we stay in jobs for decades on end. The new job is knowing the problem you want to solve. My friend Rachel advocates for children's rights. My friend Kathy helps women understand the toxins in their environment. My friend Kyle helps the most creative people in the world tell their stories on stage. It's often a signal that you're talking to someone interesting when they talk about what's changed in the world as a result of their work, not the titles or the accreditations they've held. If I want to increase prosperity for all, I might write policy in local government. I might work for a local charity that increases access to local economic development. I might even work for a bank to figure out how to get new types of people, checking accounts. Freeing me from this orientation towards professional titles allows me to be so many things in advancing an important agenda. Why should it matter if I do it from inside of a charity or inside of a bank? Why do people even care? Well, it seems to matter to a lot of people. We as humans love to credentialize each other, and it's not a bad impulse. It tries to bring clarity to situations that feel murky. But it becomes a challenge when people get left behind because they don't have a fancy title or a credential to participate. More often than not, if we can't fit people into a tidy box, we don't give them a chance. I've never had that impulse to chase titles. Because every time I get close to something I think I want, I realize that titles come with preconceived notions of how change happens. Change requires power to lie at the top. Change requires an understanding of people to come from desk research. Change requires experts to speak on behalf of people whose problems we're trying to solve. So let me tell you how I describe what I do. I say that I design for the public interest, and I work to design systems that give people power. Now, when I say this, I get one of two reactions. Either a blank stare, as people try to understand what it is that I mean, or they nod voraciously <laughs> so that I think they understand, and we can just go on talking about something else. I've worked to give people power by bringing children to policy tables, bringing newcomers to the center of capital projects in marginalized communities, and bringing frontline caseworkers into the design of critical benefits that they deliver every day. I look for places, spaces, and systems where citizens' voices aren't heard. Because I believe that when we engage those closest to the problem we're trying to solve, we have a better chance at designing a solution that actually meets their needs. And I believe that it is our right to be considered. And that's actually maybe even a simpler way of des describing what I do, that I pe help people understand that we all have a right to be considered. For a long time, most of my work was done alongside folks who had dedicated their entire lives and careers to making social change happen. And social change makers, myself included, are the worst sometimes because I hear this painful orthodoxy all the time. The social sector is good, the corporate sector is bad. This is the accepted and unchallenged wisdom around change making. And it turns out it isn't true. So I decided to try an experiment. A few years ago, I decided that working exclusively in the social sector wouldn't help me scale the impact that I wanted to see happen in the world. If we want to increase access to dignified housing, we need to work with insurance companies. We need to work with banks, housing experts, perhaps those even in academia. If we want cities more like what urbanist Jane Jacobs envisioned they would be, 
safe places with eyes on the street and a di diverse array of commercial and community and recreational amenities. We need to work with developers, policy officials, community organizations, and small business owners. So I accepted the position to lead the Canadian studio of the oldest design and innovation firm in the world. We work to bring together people and organizations in the public and private sector to remind them that if they focus less on protecting their scale, their size, and their market share, and they focus more on building things that are driven from deep and nuanced human insights, they win, and they can still make money. I wanted to see if we could have a material impact on the issues that matter by bringing billion-dollar organizations into these really cool places, the homes, the lives, the workplaces, and hearts of the people that they're trying to serve. Essentially, we teach large organizations how to listen and have them confront their organizational egos about how much they actually know about the people they're trying to serve. So often they orient themselves towards what's feasible and viable, that they completely forget what's desirable for people. Now this is not because large organizations are bad or because they don't care. It's because they think that people problems are too small and the problems they're trying to solve are so big. And they forget that small people problems are their big problems. As an example, our studio was recently engaged by our federal government in Canada to solve the challenge of onboarding seniors to one of the most critical benefits programs available to them. Now, it should be known that this program has single-handedly contributed to reducing poverty for seniors living in Canada. And the federal government had a hunch that creating digital platforms would facilitate and increase access. They had invested a lot of money against developing against this hunch, and they hadn't gone and talked to people yet. So we went and talked to people. We went and talked to seniors and social workers helping seniors, and we discussed the experience of aging. And we heard two things. One, it's really embarrassing to age and feel like you need handouts from the government. And two, even if you do, when you're a senior, you don't have a Sherpa. You don't have someone beside you to help you figure it all out. And so we spent all this time looking for this big transformational digital innovation. And really what we needed to create to solve this very critical problem was a PDF. 26 pages that quickly and simply educate seniors that A, it's a benefit, it's not welfare, it's just a thank you for being Canadian. And B, you can literally trace your finger along a decision tree in a few minutes and figure out if you're eligible. And as designers, our instinct was to make it cool and interactive. And we kept getting told by seniors and social workers not to bother because they were just going to print it out anyways. We learned that we weren't, in fact, serving a digital mandate, but we were addressing the shame and opaqueness of government systems. It was a literacy building exercise, not a digital one. And it takes courage to solve for something that specific, like solving for shame. But when we do, we save millions of dollars we address a need very quickly. The solution is now out in the world. It's not caught up in the machine of government. And we invest in building the right thing once instead of partially effective things twice. This work matters. In real life, it's not as pithy and it involves managing a lot of anxiety, uncertainty, and egos. It requires us to honor and respect systems that people uphold and then gently and simultaneously move them toward dismantling those systems so they can create the impact that they want to have in the world. Now, people don't write managing egos, anxieties, uncertainties in most job descriptions. This work helps me achieve my goal of giving people power and supporting people to have power in their lives and communities. But when people ask me what I do, I still don't have the courage to simply say, I work really hard, and I try to create systems that give people voice. Sometimes I get called a designer, sometimes an innovator, sometimes a consultant, and all of those titles make me shudder. They don't feel honest. They don't feel like they really capture what I do. So today I challenge the orthodoxy that having a fancy title means that you have power. 
Because if I truly believe that kids can build buildings and people suffering with addiction issues can design the most thoughtful healthcare systems, and new moms can design the most enveloping retail experiences, then I have to believe that they can do it without credentials, without a fancy title that they can hang their hat on. Innovating large institutions and big bad companies meant leaving the social enterprise that I built and ran for 10 years. You know, most people know me as a, as a thinker in social change and, and citizen engagement and civic innovation, and here I was, going to run a design studio that had just been purchased by the largest management consulting firm in the world. In the minds of most people, I was definitely leaving the world of change making. And I heard the word sellout, a stint, that this was a phase I was going through. And it hurt. It felt like it was attacking my identity at its core and challenging what I was actually trying to do. It left me feeling judged. But these feelings were signals to me. They were signals that I was pushing up against some entrenched orthodoxies about who owns change-making. I am learning that social change cannot just be left to those working in the social sector. I'm learning that we have to diversify the number of entities that solve people problems. And I'm learning that those entities include both two-person art collaboratives and billion-dollar companies. I've often thought that this picks up on the work that one of my greatest influences, Jane Jacobs, where she left off. She wasn't a planner or an economist, yet she served as one of the most influential thinkers of our time in both of those spaces. And she used her influence to build soapboxes for others like her. She wanted it to be valued that lived experience has power and that you don't need to be an expert to make change happen. You just have to have a willingness to see that change happens everywhere. In the last line of her seminal book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, she so poignantly says that lively, diverse, intense cities contain the seeds of their own regeneration, with energy enough to carry over for problems and needs outside of themselves. I believe that when we invest in diversifying who gets to participate in solving wicked problems, we too plant the seeds of our own regeneration. We diversify the types of experiences, approaches, ideas, and expertise that give us a better shot at building solutions that stick, resilient ideas that can adapt as the world changes and evolves. So today, I challenge you, talk about what you do without a title. Please stop saying, Let, I'm just, I'm just a mom, I'm just a volunteer, I'm just a student. Don't rest on the name of your organization, your boss, your degree, your school. Give your lived experience some power. And know that, that saying, I do work that I deeply care about, and it's good, is the best credential you could ever have. Thank you.